Hello and good evening everyone. Welcome to our Blue 60s Bluehead's Virtual Seminar. Blueheads Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health-related topics for better patient care. This platform is brought to you by Blueheads Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge of medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Ihenot Adela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Heads Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Konjit Jeti here with us to have a presentation on neonatal resuscitation. Dr. Konjit Jeti is a pediatric specialist at Haramaya University. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hina. So, so today we are going to discuss about uh, neonatal resuscitation. So, the major objective of our discussion today will be identifying which neonates require resuscitation, equipment required for neonatal resuscitation, and understanding component of resuscitation, and also the uh, updating the recently updated American Society of Cardiac Surgery, update to neonatal resuscitation and how to optimize neonatal resuscitation. These will be our objectives. So successful transfusion, transf transition from intrauterine life to intrauterine life requires multiple physiologic change immediately after birth. And most of the newborns will transmuse, trans, uh, transition smoothly from in vitro to extra vitriol life, but only around 10% of patients uh, require respiratory support in only 1%, but need uh, deep or uh, critical resuscitation or intensive resuscitation. But this is a significant member in relation to those who transition smoothly. So the first step in uh, renal resuscitation is identifying which units require neonatal resuscitation and being preparedness. So being preparedness before the delivery is the first step in the major step for neonatal resuscitation success. And among this uh, having a skilled personnel is one of uh, the mechanisms for uh, delivery of high-risk infant. These are the instruments required for neonatal resuscitation. So our, our preparedness, the first one is skilled personnel, then having appropriate equipment is one of the uh, prerequisites. So suction equipment are required, using pelvic syringe, mechanical suction, tubing catheters, and uh, eponymous pressure capillaries also required. As there is intubation equipment, so as you can remember from uh, life support, ABC of life is the major mechanism. So the first step is securing the airway. So if you are not able to secure the airway, maybe alternative intubation might be required. So we should be ready for possible intubation. Medication like dextrostate person, epinephrine, azotomic saline, and naloxone hydrochloride for those uh, neonates with maternal history of opioid use uh, is also important. Detail syringe and uh, umbilical is a uh, basal catheterization equipment for possible access of uh, peripheral line might be required. Other miscellaneous equipment, including radiant warmer to maintain the temperature of the child, warm towels, cardiac monitoring, pulse oximetry, and oropharyngeal airway also might be required. Additional equipment could include, depending on the type of uh, positive pressure ventilation equipment used, you might need a compressed airway uh, source or you know, and also oxygen blender. This is for then self-inflating type of post-depressor ventilation administration type of uh, equipment. We need a compressed airway and plastic wrap to, to maintain the patient's temperature and transporter incub uh, incubator after we successfully resuscitate the child and stabilized for transportation purpose to higher institute, we might require transporting uh, already heated uh, incubators. So the next step after this first preparedness is identifying which uh, units are high risk or which might which unit might demand resuscitation after delivery. So among this risk factor, um, antipartali maternal age, older maternal age greater than 40 years, or teenage pregnancy are at risk. For those with poor socioeconomic status with maternal malnutrition, poverty causing maybe 
مع ما تعمل عند تور perfusion could be one of the risk factor determinant uh, determinant habits like smoking drug use alcohol abuse are also at risk in maternal complications or maternal medical condition like diabetes hypertension chronic uh, heart disease lung disease skin disease urinary tract infection especially the last trimester of pregnancy blood pressure blood disorders like thrombocytopenia anemia blood group compatibilities are also uh, one of the units who require resuscitation. Other resuscitation condition including previous child having stillbirth, fatal loss, uh, high risk pregnancy, or all mother is part of obstetric history, prior birth with high risk infant, antipartal hemorrhage, or premature rupture of membrane, and a serious infection during pregnancy, or present that are abnormalities, including previa, polyhydramnus, oligodramnus, and pregnancy induced hypertension or group to uh, streptococcus carrier mother, or previously group to. Group B streptococcus infected uh, child history could be these are at risk uh, mothers for uh, requiring post birth station. As a fetal condition, including prematurity, post maturity, were at risk for myocardial aspiration, intrauterine restriction, macrosomia, and having multiple gestation, congenital anomalies, including cardiac in response or anomalies, and high groups of fetalis with either uh, fetal anemia or fetal heart. Uh, failure also at risk for required of mental resuscitation. And during this, if the mother have any medical disease, preterm labor, prolapse of cord, or uteroplacental bleeding, abnormal presentation, a transverse line breach, and coronavirus or other systemic infection, forest meaning uh, discharge or incurring stained amniotic fluid, or abnormal fetal heart pattern, or non nurturing fetal, uh, non nurturing fetal biophysical profile, or instrumental delivery, sedan delivery, maternal or fetal compromise, or non nurturing administration with the mother within one hour of uh, delivery. This new it's possibly at a high risk for requirement of resuscitation. So we should be prepared in terms of skilled personnel and equipment. Uh, we should be prepared early. So after delivery of the baby, uh, there are different mechanisms. Uh, so our first one minute is uh, as, uh, in the first one minute of delivery, we should be able to uh, assess the new unit and decide on the uh, requirement of uh, resuscitation or uh, to continue with routine newborn care. So that this assessment, we have two meters, meters of assessment at the immediate last delivery. delivery. You can use Abugar score assessment at the one, the first minute and the fifth minute. And the first minute Abugar score will tell us uh, the requirement of resuscitation. And the fifth minute Abugar score will tell us uh, how much of the resuscitation is was adequate or to tell us adequacy of the resuscitation. The other easier and shorter uh, easier in uh, to assess the unit at birth is using the three uh, parameters. One is the tone of the baby, is it hypotonic baby, floppy baby, or is it well uh, the child with good tone? The other is breathing pattern of the child, is he having breathing, not breathing, or having gasping type of breathing? And the other is also the uh, respiratory effect of the child. And these are important parameters to assess the baby. So if the baby is active, crying, breathing, and having good tone, we'll continue to the routine essential newborn cares, which includes the uh, drying and stimulating the baby and assessment of uh, as well as you have car score and weight measurement, then cord clamping and cord is cord case, so delaying of uh, cord clamping up to 30 seconds is recommended by time administration, TTC. Then uh, uh, having attachment and initiation of breastfeeding in the first one hour, then followed by uh, screening of the newborn, labeling the newborn, and having uh, uh, newborn screening in our settings are the routine is a in case. And once the child is assessed for these parameters, we should make sure the environment is uh, maintained appropriate temperature from 36 to 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. So initially, after we assess the child, and if the child is not breathing well, or if the child is having poor muscle tone or he's not crying, we'll continue to the initial stabilization phase. So in the initial stabilization phase, we'll provide words. one is environmental then have using radiant wipes, then we'll clear the airway and try and stimulate the child. So suctioning, routine suctioning is not uh, recommended unless there is a visible secretion 
of obstructing fluid in the airway. We don't recommend routine suctioning uh, for these neonates. Even if a child who is delivered to cerebral myconium, uh, suctioning should be done in an intubated child with intubation. Suctioning can be done. Other than that, we don't recommend routine suctioning unless there is visible fluid. The other is uh, warming, and the other is stimulation, tactile stimulation. A newborn is an effective uh, effect. Tactile stimulation might uh, help the baby to breathe. So non-vigorous tactile uh, stimulation involving the rubbing of the back and the sole should only be administered gently. And this tactile stimulation should not be vigorous enough to cause trauma on the baby. So after suctioning, stimulation of the baby, if there is no response, we'll continue to the airway management. So in the first, uh, after if the patient, after the stimulation drain doesn't have appropriate breathing, positive ventilation should be delivered uh, without delaying the new needs. Within the first one hour, she should be able to deliver this positive pressure ventilation using ample wax. So, and uh, so this indication for positive ventilation pressure is either a child having effective breathing or the child having a bit of less than 100 beats per minute will start uh, support in the first 60 seconds of assessment. For every 30 second delay in initiation of this positive pressure ventilation, there is 16% chance of death. So as much as possible, you should initiate uh, positive ventilation pressure in the first uh, uh, 16 seconds to be initiated. So this the rate should be 40 to 16 inflation per minute with peak inflation pressure of 30 centimeter water in terminal board. With uh, ventilation pressure in preterm units due to risk of air leak and air trauma. But if you are administering uh, as such as just compression, especially after the first one minute, this rate should be decreased to 30 uh, breezes per minute, 30 inflations per minute. So before administering positive pressure ventilation, you should make sure the positioning of the child. So as you can see, you have three positioning here. So in the first position, you can see the oropharnix, the pharnix, and the trachea are in alignment, which will uh, able to deliver effective positive pressure ventilation since the airways are open. And in the second, you can see the child. So in this case, the nose is pointed to up to the ceiling. So you can check by uh, where the direction of the nose to, uh, in relation to the ceiling. So this uh, nose to the, uh, the ceiling or same extended position are preferred for resuscitation. In flexed position, you can see the larynx and the trachea and the oropharynx are not in alignment. So this will not cause with this, this will not have effective uh, resuscitation effect, and is this is inflection of the neck and also hyperextended uh, is also the alignment is poor, so this will not deliver effective resuscitation modalities. So the positioning of the airway is one of the important parameters in the resuscitation. Then after appropriate positioning of the child in semi-extended position, the next is choice of uh, the mask, so we have different uh, choices of uh, masks. So there are pediatric size, neonatal size. So you should choose different uh, size based on the uh, size of the patient. So the, this is the correct administration. So the, the mask should not be large enough to cover the eyes or have opening below the chin. It should not be small to not cover the nose and it should not be uh, leaking from the downside of the mask, it should be appropriately covering the mouse and the nose without extra size or, or smaller size. So after picking appropriate uh, mask, we'll continue to position of the child. And when you position the child, we use our the little finger, uh, the ring finger and middle finger for positioning the neck of the child. As you can see, we elevate the mandible and uh, trust the jaw with our three finger forming the E sign. And after positioning the airway properly, we support the ambuac with our index finger and thumb and seal it with the mouse and we start ventilation. So we should gently administer 40 to 60 inflation per minute and we should not squeeze the whole uh, back. Uh, so we gently pressure, administer pressure of 30 centimeter water and we'll go to pressure ventilation. Then this is also uh, the positioning as you can see. Uh, there is the joint supported by the three fingers. This will allow for the opening of the pressure, the extension of the baby with alignment of the airways and you should support the... Yeah. 
with index finger and uh, the thumb to seal well on the mouth. And always when you administer positive pressure ventilation, you should check for chest rise. So if there is a pro no appropriate chest rise, that means you didn't maintain the airway properly. So you should make sure to maintain the airway properly. And after positioning and suction suctioning of the secretion, still if the child's chest is not expanding, you should secure alternative uh, airway by intubation or using laryngeal airways. So the first step is securing appropriate airway. Then after uh, administration of this positive pressure ventilation uh, with 40 to 60 beats per minute, despite having some for 60 second, if the child's heart rate remains below uh, 60, we continue to uh, just compression. So we'll, we'll see for 30 seconds, we'll see for the first 50 seconds of administration, then we see the response of the child and our efficacy of the method of administration of the positive pressure ventilation. If you are properly administering the positive pressure ventilation, we'll continue for another 15 seconds, total of 30 seconds. Then after 30 seconds, if the child is not breathing well, or the heart is below 60, we should continue to chest compression. So the chest compression will be given in through to one compression, in three compression with one ventilation ratio. And sh uh, ventilation should be customized before, always starts before compression and possibly into tracker situation. So first, we should make sure the airways properly open and properly ventilate the child at least for 30 seconds. So for chest compression, we have uh, two mechanisms. We have the the two thumb technique and we have the two finger technique. So the two thumb technique will uh, wrap our hands around the new unit and using the two thumb at the uh, sternum will compress the chest and the uh, two finger technique we use the two finger and at the site of symphoid process between the symphoid process and the nipple will administer this uh, compression. So the Two thumb techniques is more preferable due to it is having good efficacy during a diastolic filling and it have good perfusion. It have higher systolic pressure output and it have also good cardiac perfusion during the diastolic phase. So during the diastolic phase, so the two thumb technique is preferable. So intravascular access, so after initiation of compression and continuing compression with ventilation, we should have, so if the chain is not responding for just compression and diet access, you know, just compression and positive pressure ventilation, the next step is medication. So we need peripheral access and for the intervention. So peripheral access, the um, black albinous catheterization is recommended access, recommended route of uh, access, but intravenous, uh, intraosseous models are also possible. If you have peripheral line, peripheral line is also uh, possible. So if nephrine is indicated, if the heart rate remains below 60 beat per minute, despite 60 seconds of chest compression and adequate ventilation. So after 30 seconds of respiratory uh, positive pressure ventilation or response, another 60 seconds with uh, adequate chest compression still. If the heart rate is below 60, and we continue to administer epinephrine. So aspirin should be administered intravenously with 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 milligram per kg or by endotracheal Q, 0.05 up to 0 0.5 milligram per kg. But if the for those, unless for those child is intubated and not having peripheral umbilical catheter, the uh, peripheral administration or intravenous administration or peripheral enzyme, the endotracheal administration. So the, the intravenous administration of better absorption than the endotracheal administration. So epinephrine dosing may be repeated every three to five minutes. So the exact amount of dose that we should administer two, three, or five times is not known. It's a controversial part of non-natal resuscitation, but repeated doses are required. And if the heart rate remains below 60 beats per minute and three to, every three to five minutes, we can administer this epinephrine. Without response to a resuscitation in uh, or suspected blood loss, so after administration of epinephrine, if the child still have no response, so the next step we should suspect is hypovolemia. So this hypovolemia resuscitation should be done with normal saline, blood, or ring lactate. For patient, those patients suspected to have any blood loss, could be placental cause, birth trauma, those have blood loss, uh, uh, are rich negative, and cause much blood is preferable. But those do not have uh, overt evidence for blood loss or volume loss, normal saline, or that are preferable. 
So the peripheral access I added for administration of uh, peripheral line, administration of nephrine or volume expansion. This is the umbilical catheter, as you can see, the umbilical, umbilical uh, stamp up two arteries in one vein. So we, can, we will use the vein for catheterization purpose. Then we will secure the catheterized uh, vein with bilateral uh, Tips and we will administer the epinephrine blood or the normal saline through the umbilical vein. This is the easiest way of administration. So in general, we when we see the algorithm for resuscitation, so the earlier step is antenatal counseling and team briefing and equipment check. So you should we should be ready for resuscitation. We should have teams at least uh, of three individuals to give just compression. We give biomass ventilation, we administer the drug, and someone who will check the adequacy of the station and uh, equipment availability. So then, after birth, we assess if the child has good tone, the breathing well. So if the child is having good tone, breathing well, crying, will continue to maintain newborn care, which include warming, maintaining temperature, positioning the airway, uh, clear section if there's any uh, secretion. And then trying to stimulate in the child ongoing evaluation administration, ongoing evaluation for any of the congenital malformation, administration of prophylactic therapies. But if the child is not having poor tone or breathing, having gasping, breathing, or not crying, we'll continue to warm it and maintain the temperature, position at the area to abstain, clear the secretion if there is any uh, secretion and trying and gently stimulating the child by rubbing the back and the sole of the baby. Yet still, if the patient is having acne or gasping breathing, or if the heart is less than 100, we'll continue to positive uh, pressure ventilation. So we'll continue to positive pressure ventilation and we'll monitor saturation and consider EEG monitoring. So EEG, ECG monitoring. So ECG monitoring is the best uh, way to the heart rate of the child and uh, oxygen saturation should be monitored with pulse oximetry. Then, after positive pressure uh, administration for uh, 30 seconds, if there is heart rate still below 100 beats per minute, we'll continue to check if there's just a uh, movement, making sure we have administering the positive pressure administered properly and ventilation corrective step if it's not being administered properly or if we didn't secure the airway properly, securing endotracheal intubation and laryngeal mask, uh, mask for airway, then we'll continue again our positive pressure ventilation. But still, if the heart rate, if this there is effective administration, we'll continue to uh, heart rate beats when it's still less than 60, we'll continue to administration of uh, medication. So as child, if not intubated, after during the chest compression, the child should be intubated. And if the child is already uh, not intubated, then continue to administer 100% oxygen intubation, monitor the ECG, and administer chest compression, as you have said, using two times the method, and uh, coordinate appropriate easy pressure ventilation. Then umbilical catheterization should be considered by now because if the child is not responding for our chest compression, we continue to indication administration. Then after another 16 seconds, it's still if the child has to be less than 60, uh, we administer intravenous epinephrine. If the heart rate uh, responds in greater than per minute, considering uh, we consider hypovolemia, those uh, peripheral pool. Uh, perfusion or child having increased thoracic, thoracic pressure with pneumothorax differential should be considered. The child is not responsive, still not responsive for uh, your uh, just compression and volume administration. So our target uh, predictor saturation after birth. So we will uh, attempt to maintain appropriate uh, normal saturation after 10 minutes of the delivery so of 85 to 90 percent 95 should be reached by 10 minutes after delivery so when uh, we shall we declare a failed resuscitation so in the fund uh, failed to respond despite properly executed resuscitation the following finding may help us certain possible identify the causes so this failed uh, resuscitation could be one failure to respond for positive pressure ventilation could be caused by inappropriately secured airway which might be caused by mechanical blockage of the airway with meconium, mucus, 
quanala trigial congenital malformation in pharyngeal airway malformation like Rubin's sequence or laryngeal airway. So these congenital anomalies might have caused difficulty in securing the airway of the child. And the other is impaired lung function due to pneumothorax, pulmonary effusion, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, pulmonary dysplasia, congenital pneumonia, Disease patient might have impaired function, so they might have failed to see pressure ventilation. The other is central cyanosis. Also, uh, despite our uh, positive pressure ventilation, oxygen administration, the patient might have not corrected uh, targets to reach the target saturation. This could be due to congenital heart disease, patient having percent bradycardia with lower heart rate due to heart block, and apnea due to brain malformation, hypoxic encephalopathy, congenital neuromas, blood disorders, and responsible depression from maternal drug, especially opioids, might cause persistent apnea despite our appropriate administration of positive pressure ventilation. So, this differential diagnosis should be considered before declaring the child failed resuscitation. So discontinuous resuscitation, the decision uh, to discontinue resuscitations should be individualized based on the stational age of the baby, fatal condition associated with congenital anomaly, resource availability after continuation of resuscitation, and parental uh, wishes should be uh, taken into consideration for uh, continuing or discontinuing resuscitation. So the fetal heart, if the fetal heart rate is not dictated at 20 minutes after birth, despite resuscitation, despite appropriate and uh, adequate resuscitation, the goal of the care needs to be addressed. So this uh, timing is controversial in some uh, guidelines that recommend 10 minutes of resuscitation. In others, they recommend out to extend up to 20 minutes. So uh, beyond this uh, hours of minutes of resuscitation, the uh, patient might have poor outcome, so it's not recommended to extend beyond these uh, uh, minutes. So post-resuscitation case, uh, the longer and the greater the extent of resuscitation, the more likely that there will be a complication after the resuscitation. So that's why we don't uh, recommend prolonged resuscitation if the child is not responding. So it's complications, or if you take longer time for resuscitation, there is highly likely the child will have chronic complications. So among these complications, uh, so uh, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and CNS complication going that is apnea, seizure, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy are one of the acute complications and any child post resuscitation that should be followed in intensive care unit and EEG monitoring and pulse oximetry monitoring should be uh, continued. Other complications, pulmonary complications include pulmonary hypertension, pneumonia, pulmonary air leak and transient tachypnea of the newborn and patient could also be have hypoglycemia, hypotension, electrolyte imbalance could be there and feeding difficulty post especially due to the hypocalcemia, patient hypokalemia might have illness, gastrointestinal bleeding due, due to the stress and dysfunctional suckering or swallowing corrupted to intubation and positive pressure administration. So this was uh, my uh, discussion. Thank you. If you have any question, the floor is open. All right. Thank you very much, doctor, for the nice presentation. And participants, if you have any question, you can write your questions in the chat box. So, Dr. Lahun Saifu asked PPV in meconium aspiration. Uh, OK, so that's a good uh, question. So positive pressure ventilation in meconium aspiration, child, as we have said, so if there is suspicion of meconium aspiration syndrome. And if the child is born through meconium stained amniotic fluid, having respiratory distress since delivery and stained umbilicus, fingernails, so uh, you should have suctioning first. So, but this suction should not be done superficially from the oral, the oral pharynx. The child should be intubated and the whole area should be sectioned before administration of positive pressure. Uh, ventilation. So the feel of oral suctioning during the, if in child with meconium aspiration is when you suction the mouth, you will push down the, uh, the meconium in the lower airway into the leg, causing more obstruction. So due to this, uh, the intubation of the child and proper suctioning is recommended before positive pressure ventilation. Then after proper suctioning, the, you can continue with your positive pressure ventilation. Binyam Suyum asked, administration of dopamine during resuscitation? 
So dopamine, so uh, the first line drug we use is just dopamine. So the first we use is epinephrine. So epinephrine can be used every three to five minutes depending on the cardiac uh, heartbeat of the child. If the first dose still uh, heartbeat less than uh, 60, every three to five minutes you repeat the uh, epinephrine. So dopamine is not preferred, but if the child have no response, uh, then you should consider hypovolemia, the first step, then you sh should resuscitate the child with normal saline, uh, 10 to 20 ml of normal saline, and or ringer lactate, or if you suspect any blood loss, you should uh, uh, also transfer the child with blood before administration of dopamine. So the first line is uh, adrenaline than dopamine. Okay, I think so, the next. Ibrahim, Ibrahim asked how to prepare 10% dextrose. Okay, 10% uh, dextrose preparation, uh, as you know, it, you, we use 10% uh, dextrose for multiple reasons in unit. The first one is as a maintenance fluid in the first uh, 24 hour. We use for treatment of hypoglycemia for those who are uh, asymptomatic up to a meal per kg and symptomatic. 40 ml per kg. So we prepare 10% uh, dextrose. Let's say we have a 3 kg baby and we prepare, we, are, we want to administer maintenance fluid, 60 ml per kg. So for this child, for 24 hour uh, maintenance, we require 60 ml times 3, so 180 ml of fluid over 24 hour. So this is like 10% dextrose. So we prepare 10% dextrose from 85% uh, D5 and 15% dextrose, 40%. So for 40% dextrose. So the 85% is dextrose 5% and the 18%, the 15% is dextrose 14%. That means you can multiply 180 by 0 0.85 to, five, to find the amount of dextrose 5%. And again, you can multiply the 80 ml by 0 0.15 to, to find the amount of dextrose 40%. So you prepare D10 by dextrose 10% by combination of 5% dextrose 85% and 50% of dextrose 40%. So Binyam Siyum again asked, what if epinephrine is not available? So oh, epinephrine, epinephrine should be available, <laughs> sadly. So there is no, there is no other alternative. Uh, so till now, epinephrine, the first line required. Okay. Fantan Allen, do you have any comment about suction depth and timing for neonate with aspiration of meconium? So as you have said earlier, so the depths with uh, intubation with ET tube, insertion of ET tube should be uh, 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 suctioned. And the timing, initially, if the child is having poor breathing and poor crying, the first step should be suctioning in, economics, uh, in child born through economic aspiration and suspected to have economic aspiration. Okay. Dr. Hewitt said, thank you for your nice presentation, Dr. Konjit. And is there any research related to appropriate neonatal resuscitation in our country? I would like to know how many physicians follow what you discussed here in appropriate manner, if you could. So, uh, sadly, I did not check any researches recently, uh, but uh, there was one study I have seen in uh, uh, done in one of the southern Ethiopia. So for knowledge, they, they didn't assess uh, practice, but they assessed knowledge and attitude. And the knowledge uh, was 60, 46% had good knowledge. So this shows us there is a poor knowledge uh, in uh, administration of uh, neonatal association. Thank you. So Barakat Ab said, thanks a lot, Doc. And why do we prefer using D10 as a maintenance fluid? in the first 24 hours of neonatal life. Okay, so the first step is, uh, the first reason is fear of hypoglycemia. So in the first uh, uh, one, 
hospital delivery in the in the first 24 hour if a child is having any reason for admission and requiring maintenance blood might be critically ill so at risk for hypoglycemia so hypoglycemia is one fear the other is uh, the fear of sodium administration so a child that prone for hypernatremia in the first 24 hour of birth so in fear of this hypernatremia we prefer to administer dextrose containing blood than saline containing uh, blood uh, sorry saline containing fluid so the one is hypoglycemia the other reason is to the fear of hypernatremia in the first 24 hour okay uh, I believe there's only one last question and we can address that. What is the initial oxygen concentration of, for uh, positive pressure ventilation, both for less than 35 weeks gestational age and greater than 35 weeks gestational age? Sorry, the oxygen? What is the initial oxygen concentration for PPV, both mm -hmm. for less than 35 weeks and above 35 weeks? I'm not sure. Okay, so I think the question is when you administer positive pressure ventilation in preterm and term units, we have different yeah. target of oxygen administration, oxygen saturation because of risk of retinopathy, intracranial hemorrhage. We have different target for oxygen administration. So we use lower uh, oxygen concentration in so those preterms and a higher oxygen concentration for greater than 35 week uh, gestational age. So it's not preferable to use this compressed airway is compressed uh, airway sources will be used in those preterms and for those uh, term units we can use uh, patients with uh, we can use cylinder oxygen. So we have lower oxygen, we have lower oxygen tension for patient who is less than 35. Okay. Uh, which one is more effective, adrenaline, adrenaline IV or ET tube during resuscitation? Adrenaline IV is more uh, preferable than ET tube administration. Yeah. So Dr. Hewitt sent you a message, said, therefore, we have to think about doing research regarding this important issue. I would like to know your interest in this regard. That's a nice idea. I appreciate that. I All agree right. with that too. So we know if you know the, the our knowledge status, attitude, and how much we are practicing and effective effective practicing method, then we can intervene uh, easily. Just knowing the weakness of our health provision might have us intervene early. All right. So, Doctor Kondit. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. Uh, we are glad that you presented such an important topic on our platform, and we hope to have you in future seminars with other topics as well. And it was a pleasure having you. And if you have any last remarks that you want to address, let me give you the stage one last time. Okay, thank you for your nice coordination. So my message is, uh, Always be prepared. That is so for any child before delivery. But one of component of birth preparedness having that the possibility a child might require resuscitation. So keep in mind always a child should have uh, appropriate uh, should require resuscitation. The other is in all of our labor work. I think minimum required equipment should be up in all of your working area. Try to have at least a minimum of uh, requirements for resuscitation equipment always should be available at uh, labor wards. And the other issue is a um, common mistake we see during the station is the administration of positive pressure ventilation. We should make sure the child have appropriate airway and we are expanding the lung. So you should see if the chest is rising properly and if the child is having, so if you are administering appropriate positive pressure ventilation, you will see the improvement in saturation of the patient. So by oximetry follow-up of the saturation and looking for the appropriate chest rise and making sure the airway is maintained properly is important. And the other thing is we should not prolong, could be from empathy, from we can come from good place, but we should not prolong resuscitation more than it's required because this child is up. So we have said they have might have poor outcome, poor neurologic outcome, outcome in the future. So we should not unnecessarily prolong resuscitation.
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanjit, and uh, good night. Good. Thank you.